We are moms who are pouring ourselves into our children every hour of every day. We are grandmothers who are also playing the role of primary caretaker. We are moms who are waiting to have children and trying our best to see the struggle through the eyes of God. We are moms who are learning the challenges of a blended family. We are moms in the workplace who are trying our best to balance competing expectations and demands. We are moms with adult children who are leaving our homes to pursue their own dreams. For packing lunches late at night, for cleaning out their backpacks, then filling them again, for offering gentle guidance to your own grown children, for becoming taxi drivers and appointment schedulers, for making sure the right baby doll is in their arms before they go to sleep, for helping them pay back their student loans, for cleaning and sterilizing and cooking, for doing their laundry and his laundry and our laundry, for praying and loving and forgiving and falling down and rising to your feet again. For the mom who is overworked and exhausted. For the mom who seems to spend a million hours on a million little things. For the mom who pours Jesus into her family as best she can. And God himself not only celebrates what you do, but rejoices over the uniqueness of who you are. You are seen and you are loved without limits. Welcome to Mother's Day. Good morning, Vertical Church. It's Mother's Day. We pray God's blessings for you today. Thank God for all the mothers. We pray everybody's been blessed, well, and healthy, guys. We love you guys so much. We miss you so much. Welcome to Vertical Church. If this is your first time here being with us, my name is Ryan. I get to serve as the lead pastor here at Vertical Church. It is my pleasure and honor to be able to serve our Vertical Church family. And I'm so glad if you're new here with us that you decided to join us this morning. Our mission, our goal, our dreams, our vision, everything here is around one thing. We want to see everyone connected to Vertical Church do three things. Believe, belong, and become. Believe in Jesus Christ. Belong to his beautiful multi-ethnic church and become disciples that make disciples. We want to see you become exactly what God wants you to be. And today we're excited as we're able to celebrate Mother's Day together. We're going further into our current sermon series, Alive, a faith that lives. But before we do, we've been introducing you to some of our leaders here at Vertical Church. And today we want to introduce you to Tameric Morrison. We call him TK. And TK is our music director at Vertical Church. I want to take a moment to introduce you to TK. Let's hear from TK, guys. Vertical family, I hope you're doing well. My name is TK Morrison. I get to serve as the music director on staff. And I just stopped by for a quick second to let you know that we miss you. Yes, you, even you. No, I'm just glad. Well, we miss you. We've been praying for you. We love you. We've been thinking about you so much. And we've even been praying that even amidst these uncertain times that God has still proven faithful to you. Listen, I want to encourage you. If you haven't been watching this series alive, Listen, I want you to tune in. I want you to hashtag get your notes ready because you know good students take notes. Listen, my faith has come alive tremendously ever since Pastor Ryan has been walking through the book of James. I want you guys to tune in. I want you to drop fire emojis in the comments. I want you guys to say, hey, man, preach that. That was good. You better preach it, PR. Listen, let's get engaged. Let's get excited. It's going to be awesome. Love you guys. See you soon. Praying for you. Thanks, TK, man. We love you, bro. Thank God for everything that you're doing as you are helping Vertical Church accomplish its mission and its vision. We're praying God's best for you. Now that we're here, a couple of things we got to make sure that we do. We want to make sure that we're all prepared because today is also Communion Sunday. We'll participate in communion. So if you haven't yet, you got a little time to get your bread and your juice as we prepare to take communion after the sermon today. That's going to be exciting. Second Sunday of the month, we like to do communion together. But also, I want to remind you guys that, listen, we want to make sure that you are taking care of yourself. I know that there have been different phases that are being released in our community, in our country, but we want you to err on the side of caution and we want you to be conservative, use wisdom and be prayerful and protect yourself. Wash your hands when necessary, wear your mask. 
uh, still try to stay at home as much as possible. We are still looking forward to be able to come back together as soon as we feel it is safe, as soon as we feel it's in the best interest of our church. Now, before we get into our worship together, we know there's a couple things we want you to do. First of all, let's make sure, especially if you're watching on Facebook Live, share, tell somebody. Maybe if you're watching on YouTube Live, you can invite somebody to come watch the service with you today. If you're on Facebook, just host a watch party. That's the easiest way to let everybody know that follows you that you're watching the service and you're inviting them to watch it with you. The second thing you wanna make sure that you do is you jump into the chat and make sure that you let us know that you're watching. I personally am making sure I wanna see who is here. I wanna see who's checking in, who's still connected with us here at Vertical Church. There's nothing wrong with saying amen. That's good. This is my favorite worship song. Whatever it is that you wanna say, engage us there. And then thirdly, let's get everybody together. Let's get the family together to make sure that we're all watching and hearing and singing uh, a worship unto the Lord together as a family. Turn the volume where? All the way up. Let's get ready to get into church now.
are right there in your room, just lift your hands, shout to our Father. He gave us freedom to worship Him today. Come on, do it with me, say. No more shackles, no more chains, no more bondage, I am free. Say it. No more shackles, no more chains, no more bondage. I am free. Yeah. Woo. Hey. Say no more shackles, no more chains. Yeah. I am free. Yeah. And since you're free, lift up the highest praise. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Come on and lift it up right there where you are. Thank you, God, for your freedom. We thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, bless him right where you are. Glory to your name.
Well, good morning, Vertical Church. It's so wonderful to have you with us today on Mother's Day. We pray that every mother uh, feels loved and cared for. We thank God for what you mean to the body of Christ, to our families, to our homes, to our community. Today, we are continuing our sermon series, Alive, as we discuss a faith that lives, as we do a a book study to the book of James, as we are uh, looking at what does it look like to have a faith that lives, not just a faith in our mind, but a faith that has action, a faith that is alive. So I want to take a moment and go ahead and pray before we get into the word today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your incredible love. Father, I thank you that you care for us so much. Lord, I pray that you would just be with us today. Lord, we want to hear your voice. We want to know your heart. God, I pray that we would not just be hearers of your word, but God, also doers of your word. God, I pray humbly that you would purge your servant now, make me as this microphone, that I would simply magnify the things you've said into me. Father, we pray this word is good seed that is sown into our hearts, that is good soil that will produce a harvest in our lives. And Father, we pray that you get the glory, the praise, and the honor. Lord, I pray right now for anyone that is watching, listening to this word today, Lord, that you minister to their hearts today. That they hear your voice, God, that they, they know that you love them and that you see them. And God, that we would respond with obedience, with a life of worship unto you. God, we love you. We bless you. And we always thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, well as we look at this series, last and the first, excuse me, the first part of this series, we talked about a tested faith. We looked at James chapter number one. We talked about a tested faith. Then we talked about a tempted faith. And last Sunday, we kind of closed this out of chapter number one, a completed faith. Because a faith that is just our understanding or knowing, but it does not follow up with what we do, is an incomplete faith. James essentially says this last week, that our faith cannot merely be belief, but it must change and inform our behavior. James essentially says that we cannot just have an observation of God's word without obedience to God's word. James is saying that the gospel that is received must also be represented into the world around us. And so as James is about to to transition this writing in chapter number two, he's actually going to be expounding upon and expanding his idea from the end of chapter number three. He's going to start painting this picture of what does it look like to live out this faith that we have in our hearts. What what does it look like, as it says in verse 21 of James chapter number one, that this, this gospel word that has taken root, that has been implanted into us, what does it look like for us to live this out every single day of our lives? What does it look like to have a faith that that lives? Because we got to understand this is so important for us is that it's just not us enduring and and withstanding the test and enduring temptation, but there is so much that impacts the world around us based off what, listen to me, church, what Christians do, listen to me, and what they don't do. Mm -hmm. Because what we do speaks of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. What, What we do actually represents and represents Christ. So what we do matters. So we want to understand, I believe what James is saying is it's not just the faith as far as an understanding or a knowledge or or a cognitive uh, understanding of faith, but, but it is something that changes how we live our life. And I want to start today with, with a quote that my brother KJ shared with me in our conversations over the last couple of weeks. I want you to read this. It says, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, but walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. That is where an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. Uh, uh, this is by Brennan Manning. He says, listen, essentially this, uh, that the, the greatest uh, or the single greatest cause of atheism, those that don't believe that a God even exists, are Christians, people that profess one thing and live something completely different. And I believe what James is saying is, listen, we cannot claim one thing in Christ, but live something else completely different. And as we transition to chapter number two of James, we're about to see this practically played out that we don't want to, here it is, deny him with our actions. Because a lot of people profess Jesus with their words, but deny them with their behavior. 
that they profess him with their words, but they deny him with their walk. That they profess him with what they sing, but they deny him and how they, they serve and share in love with one another. And so today, I, I want you to really wrestle with this real quickly before we move too far into the message. Do you deny Jesus? Yeah. Do, do you deny your faith? Do you proclaim one thing and perform something different? Do, do you deny him? Do you deny the gospel that has been so generously given it to you? See, I can say this, and I know that we fail to live with Christ at the center. When we do that, we deny Jesus and the gospel. When, when we do not love with all, do not love God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul and our strength, we, we deny our faith in God. Watch this. When we do not love our neighbor as ourselves. Or as Jesus Christ command says, that we do not love G others the way Christ has loved us, we deny him. When what is professed with our lips, as, Brian, as, as Brennan, Brennan says, when what is professed with our lips was never truly been lived out in our life, we deny him. And one of the ways I believe this happens is when what is professed in our lips has never taken root in our heart, it becomes a denial in our life. When what has been professed with our lips has never taken root in our heart, it becomes a denial in our life. And I believe I see this in James chapter number two, really just verse number one, as James transitions the tone of the text. Says, let's, let's get into the specifics. Let's get into the, the nitty gritty. Let's, let's not zoom out. Let's, let's zoom in and focus on some specific things over the next couple of chapters. In James, he's going to get very detailed in what it looks like to deny the faith in God or, or to display the faith in God. And I, I believe we see this in James chapter number two. Uh, get your Bibles out. James chapter number two, verse number one. It says this, my brothers... Watch this. Show no partiality as you hold the faith. As you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. I want to read again. He says this. After all, he says in chapter number one, he says, let's get into the specifics. He says, my brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the Lord of glory. James essentially says this. He says, now, now let's look at what it looks like to live this faith out. Let's, let's look at what it means to be a, 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 have a faith that lives. And the very first thing he discusses is what they call the sin of partiality. That's what we're going to talk about today. The, the sin of partiality, the sin of favoritism. Watch this. The sin of discrimination. And right here, I believe that one of the things that he's trying to tell us is that, listen, that the first place we have to address this issue of a faith that lives, it's not in how much you read your Bible. It's not in how many songs you sing. It's not in your attendance record at the church. It's not even how much money you give to the church. It's really, it starts with how you interact with other people, how you deal with humanity. And here's our big idea. I want you to see this because I believe that we have to really grasp this, that if we don't do this, we will deny the faith that we say we believe in. Our main idea today, our big idea today is a faith that lives is displayed or denied through how we see, seek, and serve others. I want you to see this. That James starts out just in verse number one. We saw it in, in chapter number one that he comes right to it. He hits it hardcore. He says, listen, a faith that lives is displayed or denied. It's going to be one or the other. That with every decision that you make, you're either displaying faith or you're denying it. With how you treat others, you, you display faith or you deny it. Watch this. With what you say and what you don't say, either you're displaying your faith or you're denying it. And I want us to understand that if we're going to be followers of Jesus Christ, mature saints, we got to understand that how we see other people, how we seek and how we serve them is actually a denial or a display of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Are y'all with me? And so today I want to talk about that. What does it look like for us to display or deny our faith? What does it look like? So, so let's get some context here. Uh, uh, James now has encouraged us to, to withstand in chapter number one. 
And then he transitions and says, listen, now this is what it looks like to live our faith. And he goes now in James chapter number two to actually not just say to us to, to make sure we don't try to hold partiality in one hand and our faith in the other. He says, listen, you can't do that. But he actually takes the time to give an example, a picture, because we believe this is something that was happening in the church. And I want to read to you James chapter number two, verses two through seven. This is his follow up to his statement. So he makes his statement and he essentially says, now, now let's, let me give you an example. And so let's read verses 2 uh, uh, through 7. It says this, For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who is wearing, wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place. While you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court, are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you are called? See, see James, listen now, goes into this, this picture. He actually, many believe that he goes into to something that was actually happening in the church. The church was having this issue where they were so, showing partiality. They were showing favoritism. They, they were showing uh, uh, specifically saying, listen, there are some that we want to treat better than others. We want to look down on one group of people and we want to honor another group of people. And the Bible very specifically calls this sin. Yeah. I know a lot of times we think about certain things as sin, but I want to tell you that favoritism, discrimination, partiality is Sin. Now, one of the things that James is trying to deal with here, he's trying to say, listen, you can't hold faith in Jesus Christ and be partial. No, no, no. You, you, you can't claim to understand the gospel and have preference over somebody else. You, you, you can't hold the truth of the gospel and the love that God has so gracefully shown you. And then on the flip side, behave and, and conduct yourself in a way towards other people to mistreat or belittle somebody else and elevate somebody else. Watch this to your benefit. Yeah, yeah. This is what we call our orthodoxy versus our orthopraxy. Now, now, orthodoxy is what we call our, our belief. And, and when we study religion, we understand this and that, that orthodoxy is what you believe. The correct, that word ortho means to correct or straighten. It says, listen, our, our straight belief should lead to our orthopraxy, our correct uh, conduct. So our correct belief should lead to our correct conduct. And James is saying, listen, if the gospel has been rooted in you, y'all got to stay with me, that if the gospel is in you correctly and it is growing out of you, that the correct gospel, proper orthodoxy will lead to proper orthopraxy. Here it is. But if we don't have proper orthopraxy, which is our conduct, it causes us to question if we even have proper orthodoxy. And so James is saying you cannot hold this belief and your behavior contrast what you say you believe. You, you got to see this. This is the problem in the text. And I would dare say the problem in the church that many of us can, can run the risk of, of cognitively believing that we have a be good belief system, but we know that it's not a good belief when our behavior doesn't align with the word of God. See, I, I want you to ask yourself real quickly, uh, am I more of a person that, that says, listen, I, I know what I believe, but it should not inform how I behave. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, to think that the gospel is only impactful to your soul between you and God is a misunderstanding of the power of the gospel. No, the power of the gospel is not just a soul thing. No, it is an entire person thing that shapes and redefines how you see the world and how you live in it. You got to see this. See, see, we, we don't want to live this way. We don't want to live, watch this, in a way towards others that God did not live in a way towards us. See, the gospel shows us impartiality. What am I saying? That the gospel saw us poor, Lord help me, saw us broken, ragged, and treated us all the same. That Jesus Christ died for us all the same. That God loves us all the same. Yeah. And because that is the good news that we have received, it should also be the good news that we live out in every single area of our life. Because if not, we will deny the good news that we have experienced through Jesus. So what is partiality? And what's the problem? See, partiality, like I said before, is favoritism or having a bias. To show favoritism is to give preference to one person over others with equal claims. It's similar to discrimination and is based on conditions such as social class, wealth, clothing, gender, race, and even in our context, sexual orientation. See, the truth is that we all have biases. We all have favorites. We all have things that we prefer. But these things, if we're not careful, if they cause us to, to mistreat one group, if they cause us to look down our noses at others, if they cause us to devalue or dehumanize someone else, then it becomes a prejudice. Then it becomes favoritism and partiality and discrimination. That's when it becomes sin. Yeah. See, you're going to have preferences no matter who you are, but your preferences should not have you. Uh huh. You, you have to say, listen, I, I know that God would have preferred someone holy, perfect, and righteous. But, but even though that may have been the preference, I saw impartiality when he sent his son, Jesus, to die for my sins on the cross and pr brought in my sin-sick soul and loved me like a son when I had lived like a sinner. <laughs> this is the love of God. Matter of fact, God actually, James, excuse me, goes into more detail with the problem with this impartiality in James chapter number two, verse eight through 10. Watch this. He says, if you really fulfill the royal law according to scripture, watch this. He's actually referring to that the royal law in Deuteronomy says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He says, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, if you show favoritism if you think higher of one than another and treat them as such says then you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressor watch this for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it so James says listen if you show partiality this is a contradiction to what we know as the great commandment to love God and to love others, to show favoritism, to show partiality, to mistreat one person because he is not or she is not what you want them to be or not in your class or not your preference. He says that is sin. Favoritism is sin. The eyes of God. And James goes as far to say that, listen, if you do that, you are convicted of the law. And he actually says, listen, not only are you convicted of one law, but you are convicted of all 600 plus laws that are in the Old Testament. He says, listen, if you have favoritism and partiality, that's, that's breaking the law just like murder. <laughs> okay, listen, breaking one sin is breaking them all. You got to see this because breaking one sin is an offense to God. And when you offend God, there's not little sin and big sin. That there, There's not white lies and, and, and black lies. No, 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 no. These are all sin. And they're all equally wrong before our God. Partiality is sin. 
James says, if you break one of these laws, you break them all. See, the law, according to John 13 and 34, uh, is actually not just to love God, love others as ourselves, but Jesus gave a new commandment. He says this in John chapter number 13, verse 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. He says, listen, it's not just loving others the way you love yourself. No, no, Jesus raises the bar. He says, listen, the way I have loved you, you are called to love everyone else. So your standard of love for the world is God's love for you. Yeah, yeah. See, to show partiality is a failure to complete the new commandment that Christ gives us. When we show partiality, when we, are, uh, uh, when we discriminate, when we tolerate injustice, when we mistreat any group of people with any label, it is us saying that they are not worthy of our love and care when clearly, according to the cross, according to John 3.16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would uh, believe in him we shall not perish but have everlasting life that when we show partiality we're saying God they were good enough for you to love but not good enough for me to love yeah see partiality is not in the the identity or the personality or the character of God it's an affront to the gospel message of Jesus see Romans chapter 2 verse 11 says this for God shows no partiality Ephesians chapter number six, verse nine says, there is no partiality in him. Jesus says this impartiality that is being displayed cannot be held as the same hand of faith. It's like saying that you're holding a sign that says, I love Jesus in one hand and holding another sign says, but I hate, I hate you in the other. That this cannot be the, the heart of any believer or Christian. So, so here it is today. I, I want to talk about what does it look like? How do we make sure that we are not impartial? How do we make sure that we, we do not live these lives of favoritism? So I want you to write this down. I got three things I want to give you. We're going to go. Number one, we have to see others' value. Number one, we have to see others' value. It's right here in the text. Right here, James chapter 2, verse 2 through 3, it says this. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in. I, I want to stop right there. It's right here in the text. He first starts out with a picture. You got to see this. That, that he says, listen, I got to address one of the problems and that's the value system. And he really, he re I really feel like James is kind of getting at him. He says, listen, you see a person with gold and fine clothes, but you also see a person that has shabby clothes and are poor. And immediately there is a problem because when you see these two people, if you make the mistake of giving value to them by what they have and what they wear and what they look like and where they come from, You've already got a problem because you're seeing them based on how you perceive them. I want you to see this. How you see people will directly impact how you love people. When you don't see people the right way, you won't love them the right way. When you don't see them the right way, you, you, you won't love them the right way. Uh, uh, my children, I'm often having to tell them uh, with the things that I give them, the clothes that I buy them. Every one of us have had this conversation with our children. Uh, uh, you buy them a coat, a jacket, a toy. But if they don't see or value that thing, they won't treat it the right way. And this is the same thing that we have to make sure we do in our hearts as believers is that to make sure that we are seeing people, we are seeing the world the way God sees them, not the way the world sees them, not the way our social structures have seen them. But no, if Jesus loved them enough to die for them, they're valuable. They're valuable. He gives them their, their value. Yeah. See, discrimination, favoritism, sexism, racism, ageism, 
any of the questions of gender equality, any of these things are all channeled through what we see as value. As Christians, we are called to see and value people the way God sees and values people. And for many of us, these things are rooted around the issue of what I consider to be labels. Uh, If you're not careful, you will let the labels that are in our culture, that are in our world, uh, uh, actually misguide the value system of people. Just because someone is poor does not mean they are less valuable. Just because someone has been incarcerated does not mean they are of less value. Just because someone's color of their skin is a different hue than yours does not mean they are less valuable. Just because someone does not speak a language that's fluent to you does not mean that they are less valuable. Just because someone has not achieved the academic success that you have does not mean they are less valuable. And we have a culture that gives labels that were honestly designed to give descriptions, but what has happened is these descriptions have become definitions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And those definitions have created divisions. I want you to see this. What was once supposed to be a description has become a definition which creates division. I want to give this to you because one of the things that sometimes we miss is that you can describe me, but how you describe me will never define me. How you describe me is not my definition. Your description can never be my definition. My definition is found in Jesus Christ. My definition is found at the foot of the cross. My definition is found in his sacrifice, his life being laid down for me. Yes, I am a man. Yes, I am black. Yes, I am an American. That's just a description. It could never encompass my full definition. And one of the things we have to be careful of if we're going to be followers of Jesus Christ we cannot turn people's descriptions into their definitions yeah 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 how you describe me should never be how you define me the labels and caricatures that become oversimplified broad strokes of our people groups everything boiled down into one definition of a group of people is such a disgusting and damaging thing that we do to our culture To to say that men are like this, to say that women are like that, to say that black people are this or all white people are that is actually disgusting and is actually something that devalues God's beautiful creations as he has created us all uniquely. Don't let my definition be the byproduct of your description of me. See, uh, uh, I am God's created creation, creating his image in his likeness. Watch this, for his glory. He loves me and you both so much that he would send his son to die for us. And I believe one of the worst labels that we can give in our culture that we have to be careful of is the label of us and them. See, see, this us and them can actually, if we're not careful, create just a small line of devaluing one or the other. Most times these labels have negative connotations. It it highlights the worst of any people group. It it highlights the worst of any demographic. This cannot be the posture of the believer. It cannot be a us and them. We as Christians have to live in the we. (laughs) The we that Jesus died for us. The we that needed his salvation. The we that were sinners, wretched, undone. The we that were broken. The we that needed someone to redeem us. The we. That's where we have to stay first. Because if we don't, we will have a value problem. This is what many call the value gap in culture. And let's be honest, we live in that culture today. We live... In this culture right now, this culture that takes descriptions and turns them into definitions, this culture, this idea can lead to hate, discrimination, 
and ultimately in justice. We must see and value people the way God has valued all. One of the things that I have to say is that how I see shapes how I value you. You. How I identify you often shapes how we walk with each other. We live in a culture that is shaped by labels, descriptions, and actually poor value. Even right now, COVID-19 has revealed the inequalities that have been in this country all along in our health care system, in our educational systems, in our incarcerated population, showing huge disparities of care and concern for people in minority groups, black and brown, poor, less fortunate, and incarcerated are not getting the same treatment and care. This is not just a health care problem. This is a value problem. The discrimination and mistreatment of the Asian brothers and sisters in our country right now, especially on the West Coast over the last couple of months, has been beyond despicable. Value problem. The lack of care in our counties and our states for the incarcerated populations as related to COVID-19 is discouraging. It's a value problem. This week, many of us have been disappointed and discouraged by the unnecessary death of a young man by the name of Ahmad Aubrey, who tragically and unnecessarily lost his life. More importantly, his life was taken from him. And the handling of his death, the handling of this tragedy two and a half months later is a very serious value problem. This cannot be the posture of Christians. This cannot be the posture of people that claim to hold the faith of Jesus Christ in one hand but show partiality in another. This even applies to the LGBTQ community. That there are people that have devalued these people because of disagreement. Agreement with lifestyle is not required to see one's life's worth. Yeah. Disagreement should never equal mistreatment. Showing partiality is not the idea of God. In the church, we have to be different. In the church, we have to be better. In the church, we have to model to the world what it looks like to live like Christ. See, see, the problem was not with somebody being rich or the problem in the text was not somebody being poor, but it was the treatment of the two that was the problem. God does not favor the poor over the rich. God does not favor the, the well-off over the poor. No, 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 no. God does not show no favoritism, but when we do, that's the problem. When we deny equal care, when we deny equal opportunity, when we deny equal our, our chances to love and pursue what God has called us to do, this is fundamentally a value problem. And when I don't see your value, I won't treat you the right way. See, we deny the faith when we do not see people as God sees them. If you do not see your value or others' value as God's creations, you will not treat them and value them that way. So the first thing we have to do to make sure we don't live out the sin of partiality is we have to see people's value. Number two, we have to seek others' interest. Write it down, seek others' interest. See, here it is. So how we see each other's value will determine how we seek each other's interest. It's right here in the text. Watch the text. It says this. And verse number three, chapter number two says, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet. Have you not then made, here it is, underline this word in your Bible, distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts. Watch this. When you are being partial, it is for your benefit when you are impartial to someone else instead of somebody else's benefit. You're not just seeking 
their interests, you're seeking yours. See, see, the people often you are impartial to or the things you are impartial to are your preferences, your comforts, the things that you agree with, the things that you like. But Jesus says, no, we have to treat everyone the same because God treated everyone the same. I want you to see right here in the text, one of the things that stood out to me as far as seeking the interests of others, he says this, and if you pay attention, and if you pay attention, and if you would pay attention, and if you pay attention, if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing, you got to see this. James says, listen, one of the problems when you have a value problem, you will only pay attention to certain things. You'll say simple things like, well, that's not my problem, or I didn't know that was going, because you're not seeing everyone as valuable. Yeah. You'll only have concerns about the things that are closely related to you. You'll only have concerns about the things and people that pique your interest. You'll only have uh, uh, any type of uh, concern about things that are in your favor. Yeah. See, one of the things that James is doing, he says, he put the preference and the benefit up close and comfortable. That's what he does. The person in this particular illustration says, listen, uh, the person that is rich and wealthy, listen, I'm going to sit them up close. I'm going to give them a fine seat, a seat of honor. That's a benefit to them. Or on the flip side, to go and take the, the poor man and put him in the back or at his feet. You won't seek the interest of people that you don't value. You, you, you won't seek the interest of people that, that don't matter to you. You won't seek the interests of people that don't impact you. See, the Bible says this in Philippians chapter number 2, verse 3 through 4. It says, do nothing, nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interest of others. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But here it is, y'all remember from last week, but in humility, in meekness, count others more significant than yourselves. And let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interests of others. We cannot see others with us in mind. We cannot look at people to being a benefit for us. We cannot look at people and how they can, they can help us. That's a temptation that we all have. Scripture does not say, let me be clear here, Scripture does not say we should not honor others, but Scripture does say we should not mistreat others. And the problem was not that this rich man got a, a good seat. The problem was that the poor man got the bad seat. <laughs> that, that, that's the problem. The problem is not that there are people in the world doing well. The problem is when the people in the world doing well are not caring for the people in the world that are not. That's the problem. It's not the people in the world that are successful are, are doing well. There's nothing wrong with that. That scripture does not have a problem with that. Well, the problem is that when we allow that to, 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 to mess up and jack up and, and clutter how we, we apply the gospel to every person in our life. See, partiality, if we're not careful, puts us in the position of judging others by evaluating external, situational, and unchanging circumstances that are not God-driven and are not biblical. See, it's not enough if we're going to seek the interests of people. It's not enough just to see their value equally, but we must also seek to their benefit. In the story of James, this highlights that the church only sought the interests of the rich and influential man. Even worse, the poor person, they put them to the back of the room or worse, uh, they put them at their feet or says, uh, the better interpretation of the sex is that says, listen, come sit here under my footstool. It's not talking about literally speaking, sitting under a footstool, but says, this is where I value you. What's even crazier is this, is that, that the host of this gathering does not give the poor person their seat or the honorable seat, but puts them under the seat. This is what partiality looks like. 
Luke chapter number 10 actually gives us a picture of this. Jesus actually is answering the question, who is my neighbor? And what are the commands, the great commands of the law? And Jesus gives a response with a story. He says this in verse 33. He talks about a man that was robbed and left on the road. And it says actually here on Jericho that a Levite walks by him, a, a priest walks by him. But in verse 33, he says this, but a Samaritan as he journeyed came to where he was. This man that was left beaten and broken and when he saw him he had compassion watch this he went to him bound up his wounds pouring on oil and wine then he set him on his animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him this is what it looks like to be impartial this is what it looks like to seek the interest of others whose interest are you seeking It's not enough to see people in pain and feel bad. It's not enough just to say, I, 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 I ache with you. I hate that this happened. I'm sorry. It's not enough just to see that this is a valuable, but we got to do something. Jesus said the Levite walked by and the priest walked by. It was the people in church. It was the people that held faith with one hand and showed partiality with the other. See, the gospel does not just move us towards God. Write this down if you can. It moves us towards others and the benefit of them. The gospel does not just move us towards God. The gospel moves us towards others and the benefit of them. We must be reminded that Jesus looked to our interest. He moved towards us. He left heaven and earth, he was concerned, he was considered, and he showed care. This is what we have to be, church, if we're going to look to the interests of others. We have to be concerned about somebody other than ourselves. We have to be concerned about people that are living a, a, a plight of life that is not our own. We have to be concerned about people that are having experiences that are not our own. We have to be concerned about people that are suffering in different ways and not our own. We have to be concerned. We have to be considerate. What does that mean? To simply think about somebody else. If you can possibly just put yourself in somebody else's shoes, the people you potentially may show partiality to, put yourself in their shoes. And if you can't put yourself in their, sh in their shoes, this is what you got to do. You got to put yourself in their presence and ask them, what is it like to walk in your shoes? This is what should happen in the multi-ethnic church. This is what it should happen in every church, that we don't just try to put ourselves in our imagination in somebody else's shoes. No, we put ourselves in proximity to somebody else to ask them, what is it like? How do you feel? How have you experienced this? I'm concerned, but I also want to be considered. I want to think about you. Yeah. Thirdly, showing care. This is how we seek the interests of others. Galatians chapter number six, verse two says this, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Galatians chapter number 16 says this, so then as we have the opportunity, let us do good to everyone, to everyone, to everyone, to everyone. Let us do good to everyone, to everyone, to everyone, to all. Why? Because everyone has the same value. So then as we have the opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are in the household of faith. We have to seek the interests of others. And then lastly, number three, write this down. If we see others' value and we seek their interests, that will cause us to serve others' needs. Cause us to serve others' needs. How you see God and how you see others will shape how you seek the interests of others, but also how you serve others. It's right here in James chapter number two, verse eight. It says, if you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Then you are doing well. See, when I seek the interest of others, I will look, watch this church, to love them. I will look to, to love them. I will look to, to sacrificially serving love them. Philippians chapter number two says, shows us how Christ did this for us. You got to see this first thing in uh, first, uh, verse number five of Philippians chapter number two. It says this, have this mind among yourselves, which is in yours, Christ Jesus. I don't want to get to verse six yet. 
You got to have the same mindset. He says, as Christians, we got to have the same mind as Christ. We got to think like Jesus. It's not enough just to sing songs and worship him and proclaim his word. No, you got to think like him. You have to have that same life philosophy to serve and love others. Let's show it. Verse 5. Have the same mind among yourselves, which is in yours, Christ Jesus. Watch this. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form, watch this, of a servant being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Oh, man, that's good. That's good. This is what Jesus models for us. We have to have that same mindset among one another. You got to see that in the text that Jesus did not count equality. Man, he did not count equality with God as something to be grasped. No, but he lowered himself to us. He identified with us on earth so we could identify with God in heaven. He said, listen, I'm going to look to your interests, but I'm going to serve through emptying myself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form and being obedient to the point of death. He served us. And in that same way, church, we are called to serve others. One of the ways I say it like this, write this out if you can. You can serve without loving, but you cannot love without serving. Yeah, you you, you can't tell me that that you love people and you don't serve people. You, You can't tell me that you love God and you don't serve God. And I would suggest to you this, that you can't love God and not love his people. So you serve God by serving his people. Yeah, this is what we see in Christ. This is what we must see in the believer. And it starts with how we see them. It starts with how we seek them. Because we will not love God, love them God's way if we don't see them God's way. We will deny the love of God for us. Watch this. But not sharing the love of God with others. See, the gospel takes us from being a container to being a conduit. Watch this. A container collects. A conduit passes through. I said again, a container collects, but a conduit passes through. You got to see this, that when we become believers in Jesus Christ, we don't collect the good news. We are a conduit for the good news. Okay, y'all, y'all, y'all missed it. That when we receive the love of Jesus Christ, we're not a container to collect love. No, we become a container to be a conduit, a con- a conduit to pass it through. We we don't collect grace, we're a conduit for grace. We we don't collect mercy, we're a conduit for mercy. We don't just collect forgiveness, no, but we become a conduit for forgiveness. And what is that conduit to? It's, It's from God through us to others. And there should be no partiality, God help me, with who we pass the good news, the love of Jesus Christ, the value and the justice of God through to. Can't be that way. See, our action towards others is the imperative of the truth of our salvation. See, I want you to see this, that, that, that the proof, Lord help me, I'm getting into my sermon next week. The proof of the gospel being rooted in us. Is, is based on how we engage humanity. Right here, John chapter number 13, verse 35 says, By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. See, I, I don't care how much soul work you think you've done in your life and, and how much moral change has happened in your life. If it has not impacted how you relate to other people, God says we won't see it. If how you love other people that look like you and don't look like you, how you love other people that you like and don't like, how you love other people that you agree and don't agree with, how you love them is actually the picture. It is the stamp of approval that the grace of God, the gospel has actually taken root in your life. See, this is what I say. When I don't see gospel fruit, I start to question your gospel root. 
Because I begin to question, is the gospel really taking hold in your life if it does not produce gospel fruit, watch this, or God-like character in your life? Yeah, yeah. First John chapter number four, verse 20 says it like this. If anyone says, I love God, watch this church, and hates his brother, he is a liar. God help me. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Now, John says, listen, you can't love God and hate people. You, you, you can't love God and show favoritism. You can't love God and show discrimination. You can't love God and allow the prejudice to rule your life and behavior. You can't love God whom you have not seen and discriminate against those you have. The text says it right here. We have to serve. We have to love. We have to show the love that we have received. See, the question you got to ask yourself, am, am I displaying this or am I denying this? See, I deny my faith by my display. Either I'm going to display the grace that God has shown me, display the love, the value that God has shown me, I'm going to deny it. See, so you can deny your faith with your silence. <laughs> you can deny your faith with your inactivity. You can deny your faith with your lack of compassion. You can deny your faith with your, your, your failure to, to act and move for the interests of others. You can deny your faith by showing favoritism. And God calls us not to deny, not to deny that faith. Not to hold the faith in one hand and partiality in another. It's not enough to feel bad about what's going on in our world. It's not enough. No, we have to do something. We have to value everyone equally. This is a faith that lives. So here it is again. See others' value as God sees their value. <laughs> Seek their interests the way Christ has sought your interests. Serve the needs as Christ served our needs. As we close, as we prepare to take communion, I want you to take this time to, to get your elements, your juice, your bread. As we remember, we remember the gospel. We remember that that God didn't show partiality towards us. I can't speak for you, but I know for me, I don't deserve the love of Jesus Christ. I know I'm unworthy. And he didn't base his love for me on anything that I was or I've, I've done. So today, when we, we take this time to remember, to, to practice the, the, the sacrament of communion, we look back. We realign, remember, so we can realign our lives. We think back to that, that day, that, that Friday where Jesus Christ hung on the cross for your sins and mine. He died for everyone. This picture of two criminals hanging on the cross beside Jesus. One believed in him and one didn't, but he died for them both. He didn't show partiality. And today I want us to think about that. I want us to think about his incredible love for every single person equally. So I pray that you have your elements as we prepare for communion. I'm going to pray and read scripture then after communion, we'll go into a song. Jesus gives us a model of communion at the Last Supper. Before he is arrested and crucified, he brings the disciples together to inform them and show them what, it, what they'll need to do to be reminded so they don't forget the love of Jesus Christ. It says this in Matthew chapter 25, verse 26 through 28. It says this, but we should remember 
we should remember, do this in remembrance of me is what we most often think about when we consider communion. He tells the disciples to, to take bread and to take juice at wine. And the text actually is a representation of the blood of Jesus Christ. That would be shed for the remission of sins. That bread is a representation of his body that would be broken for us. Let's pray over these elements. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for these elements. Lord, we thank you for this juice and this wine, Lord, that is symbolic, that is symbolic of your incredible love. Father, I pray now in the name of Jesus that you would help us to remember so we can realign. Father God, we thank you right now for your sacrifice for us, for us all, that you died for us all the same because you love us all the same. Father, I pray that we will remember this every single day, and that it will shape how we love you and it will shape how we love others. Father, we love you, bless you, and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you would, take your bread. The Bible says they broke it and ate it. Take eat. This is his body. They say in the same way, had the cup that represented the blood of Jesus Christ Say, drink ye all of it. Let us drink together, church. I would actually you take a moment as we go into a song to think about the love of Jesus Christ, that you remember that incredible sacrifice. Let us all pray and sing together. Come on, right where you are, just lift your hands to our Father. Come on, let your worship, let your praises rise into Him.
Well, church, I pray that you were blessed by the word as we jump into James chapter number two this week, a very challenging word, and especially given what is happening in our country. Uh, it is only by God's design that this is kind of where we landed today for the word of God. As we talk about partiality, we talk about discrimination, we talk about favoritism. Let me be very clear, this is not the identity that God has called us to as believers. While we cannot control, while we cannot uh, uh, determine what the world does, as Christians, as followers, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we are called, we are commanded. It should be grown out of us. There is no partiality, no favoritism, no bias, no discrimination against anyone. That we operate in the same love that we received, we operate in that love towards others. today. If you decide to give your life to Jesus Christ, I'm so glad because Jesus Christ loved you just how you were and he calls you into a relationship to help you become who he designed you to be. And if that's you today, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take out your phone and text the word LIFE. Text the word LIFE to 919-739-3399. That's 919-739-3399. In the same way, if you're new here at Vertical Church, if you've been watching with us for a few weeks and you're a part of this, this community, you said, I've never been a part of this before, but I want to get to know you guys. I want to get connected. I want you to dial that same number, 919-739-3399, except I want you to type the word NEW. 
new type the word new to 919-739-3399 we want to connect with you we want to serve you we want to walk alongside of you we want to value you the same way that god values you and of course today we're so glad for all the wonderful people that decide to give here at vertical church to help us continue to keep the mission and the vision going at vertical church and help us complete that in the world around us if you're here and you want to give you can always go to our website www.verticalnc.org and click the give tab in the bottom left hand corner we would love and appreciate your generosity at vertical church and we're so thankful for those of y'all that choose to do so listen i love you guys i can't wait to see you guys again soon i am praying god's best for you god was not partial when it came to you and we can't be partial when it comes to others i love you guys we'll see you next week right here at vertical church